The 15th Amendment, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of race. For an originalist and a textualist, that is clear text as I see it. But when asked whether or not the president has any authority to unilaterally deny that right to vote for a person based on race or even gender, are you saying you can't answer that question? Senator, I just referenced the 14th and 15th Amendments, the same one that you just repeated back to me, that do prohibit discrimination on the basis of race in voting. So I, as I said, I don't know how else I can say it, the Constitution contains provisions that prohibit discrimination on the basis of race in voting. But whether a president can unilaterally deny, you're not going to answer yes or no. Well, Senator, you've asked a couple different questions about what the senator, uh, what the president might be able to unilaterally do, and I think that I really can't say anything more than I'm not going to answer hypotheticals. It strains originalism if the clear wording of the Constitution establishes a right and you will not acknowledge it. Well, Senator, it would strain the canons of conduct, which don't permit me to offer off-the-cuff reactions or any opinions outside of the judicial decision-making process. It would strain Article 3, which prevents me from deciding legal issues outside the context of cases and controversies. And as Justice Ginsburg said, it would display disregard for the whole judicial process. So then let's take it to uh, the case we've discussed before, Cantor versus Barr. Okay. Your 37-page dissent in this case. Mm -hmm. And yesterday, uh, the junior senator from Missouri, in attempt to rehabilitate the witness, asked you, you never say that the right to vote is somewhat secondary or less than any other right. Is that fair to say? And you answered, yes, that is fair to say. I never said that. I have read and reread this. I'm not ready for a question on the final, but I've read and reread your dissent on this. I'd like to read to you what you wrote on this very question asked by the senator from Missouri. In sum, well, let's, I think we need to establish what this case is about for those who may not know or remember. Ricky Cantor. Ricky Cantor was a con man, lived in Wisconsin. He manufactured some kind of shoe insert, a pad, and tried to sell it to people who had diabetes or some foot problems. He wanted the Medicare to say that it was approved. They didn't. He sold it anyway and made that representation. When it was all over, it came crashing around him. He cheated Medicare out of $375,000. He was found guilty of a count of mail fraud, paid $300,000 in penalties and fines. He paid out $27 million in a civil settlement and then spent a year in federal prison. So this was not some run-of-the-mill miscreant. This was a fellow who was a con artist. He came to the federal courts and said, this is unfair. I've served my year in prison. Now I want to buy a gun. And the law says I can't buy a gun if I'm guilty of a felony. And the court said, sorry, Ricky, you can't buy a gun because you are guilty of a felony. Even the Heller decision. Justice Scalia said that felonies and mental illness could continue to disqualify a person from buying a gun in this country. Two out of three judges who heard this case said, that's right. That's the law. Sorry, Ricky, no AK-47 for your birthday. But then you took a look at it and reached the opposite conclusion and did extensive research and delving into history about whether or not violent felonies should be distinguished from regular felonies. And you concluded uh, that you believed that a person who has just been found guilty or convicted of a felony should not be disqualified from their Second Amendment rights, that that should be confined to those who were dangerous, guilty of a violent felony. Here's what you said to go to the question that was asked by the senator from Missouri. Here are your words. In sum, the available evidence suggests that the right to arms differs from rights that depend on civic, civic virtue for enjoyment. The Second Amendment confers an individual right intimately connected with the natural right of self-defense and not limited to civic participation. By the very terms of the civil, civic rights argument then, the right to arms would have been treated differently than things like the right to vote or sit on juries. So here's what it boils down to. After Heller, after the decision, after Scalia's statement, you concluded that any felony can take away your right to vote, but only a violent felony can take away your right to purchase an AK-47. What? Senator, with respect, that's distorting my position. What I said in that case, which is what 
Heller said, and which is conventional in all discussions of this, to my knowledge, is that the, voting, the right to vote is fundamental. However, it is a vi an individual fundamental right that we possess, but we possess it as part of our civic responsibility for the common good. The same thing is true, for example, of jury service. Whereas individual rights, and this is again a distinction that's drawn in case law, individual rights benefit more the individual. And the entire dispute in Heller was that the majority thought that the Second Amendment was an individual right, and the dissent thought it was one that was a civic right, that was a right that people possessed, but they possessed for the benefit of society by participation in the militia. And it is a distortion of the case to say that I ever said that voting is a second-class right. That's simply not what that passage means. But the very terms of the civic rights argument, then, the right to arms would have been treated differently than rights like the right to vote. And let's get down to the bottom line here. Heller did establish the individual right. When you finished with your dissent, here's what it came down to say. If you are guilty of a felony a, that is not violent, you can lose your right to vote but you can't lose your right to buy a gun. Am I wrong? Senator Cantor had nothing to do with the right to vote. The point that I was making in that passage, the 14th Amendment actually expressly allows for states to deprive felons of the right to vote. And my point was that there was no similar language in the Second Amendment. I don't have an opinion and have never expressed one about the scope of a legislature's authority to take away felon voting rights. What I said that is that there was a history of such provisions in state constitutions and in the federal constitution, but I did not intend, and, and if my words communicated that, it was a miscommunication. I have never denigrated the right to vote. And I think it was, at best, a serious miscommunication. I'd like to read to you, in this very room, in 2005, an exchange that took place between Senator Kennedy and Judge Roberts. Senator Kennedy said, let's start with the Voting Rights Act. Most Americans think that the right to vote is among the most important tools that they have to participate in our democracy. You do agree, don't you, Judge Roberts, that the right to vote is a fundamental constitutional right? Judge Roberts says, it is preservative. I think of all other rights. Without access to the ballot box, people are not in the position to protect any other rights that are important to them. And so I think it's one, as you said, the most precious rights we have as Americans. Do you understand why I read your lengthy dissent here, where somehow or another you could say to Ricky Cantor, sorry you can't vote anymore, but buy any guns you wish. We treat those rights differently. Can you see why that would be troubling based on what Justice Roberts said? I don't, actually, Senator Durbin, because I've expressly testified here that I think voting is a fundamental right, and I didn't say to the contrary in that dissent. Well, I, I read it otherwise, and I read it and reread it, so I won't get that right on your final, but I will tell you, from the way I see your language, it is explicit. You have two categories of rights, one that's, independent, or one that's individual and another that is based on collective action, as in juries, as in voting as a group of the populace. And you've made a distinction there that I think is hard to understand, difficult to explain, and inconsistent with what Justice Roberts told us at this point. 